Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ms. Jenny uh, Lin. She's joining us uh, via a uh, landline from Houston, Texas. Uh, our show today, a pioneer at uh, Asia Tic Tac LLC. Uh, Ms. Lin is the CEO and founder of Asia Tic Tac LLC. Um, before that, she had a, a number of positions doing research in some leading research institutions in Washington, as well as an internship right here in good old Honolulu, Hawaii, at our friend's Pacific Forum, um, where she did a lot of research on Chinese military affairs, Chinese strategic affairs, etc. So we want to hear about her company, because it sounds real interesting. Uh, and. Uh, uh, then towards the end, we want to talk about um, strategic issues, of which she's also well-versed in. So welcome to Asia in Review. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're quite, quite welcome. Well, you know, your company, I, I, the name is intriguing, Asia Tic Tac LLC. Does the name tell us something about the company we should know about? I mean, is there a message there? And if so, what is the message? Well, um, first of all, the, the company name is Asia Tactic, but a lot of people relate the word tactic to Tic Tac for some reason, so it's funny when you keep saying Asia Tic Tac. <laughs> but um, I, picked, I picked the word tactic because it is a German word for strategy, and um, as I traveled to Southeast Asia, I also noticed that it's an Indonesian word. Uh, for strategy and also a Malaysian word. So oh, is that right? Tic Tac is a Malaysian and Indonesian word. I never knew that. Yeah, me neither. Until they saw my, my business card uh, in Jakarta and, re and told me that, yeah. So they remember my company name because <laughs> it is an Indonesian name and also Malaysian. That, that's, a, that's a very skillful play on words. Um, <laughs> I got lucky there. But the message <laughs> is that I came... Um, I left Honolulu um, with a mindset of actually just questioning the whole U.S. rebalance um, strategy. Uh, while in Honolulu, I researched on the security pillar of it, but didn't quite understand the economic side of it. So I saw it by starting the company, and um, in conjunction with what I've learned after my fellowship uh, with the Santa Clara Peace Foundation there, um, wanted to answer, you know, questions in my mind just as um, to how robust is the U.S. rebalance in, on the economic pillar. Um, but the company's purpose is to help the public private sector um, with their ventures into foreign markets, specifically in the Asia Pacific. Mm, 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 mm. Now, is your, is your, you say Asia Pacific, we also mentioned Indonesia and Malaysia. Are you more focused on Southeast Asia or mm -hmm. all of the Asia Pacific region? Do you have like a real focus for your company? We do. Our focus is in the Pacific Rim, so definitely Pacific Northeast Rim, Asia. Okay. Yeah, but right now the focus is on Southeast Asia and countries like Thailand, Vietnam, just because of I think that's where the U.S. and China sphere of influence really clearly overlap. So I have um, sent you two graphics, and one shows where you know what the U.S. TPP is trying to achieve, and the other graphic shows um, what China is trying to build with its Ipai Ilu strategy. So okay, so okay, and now is this hmm. what we're talking about? Um, the risk management graphic. Um, that is not the risk management graphic I showed you. The, the risk management graphic is my uh, company presentation in Jakarta. Okay. Um, our company is part of the U.S. Um, initiative. Um, on, it's called the Power Working Group for Indonesia. It's uh, about a 15, uh, 15 U.S. government agency initiative in trying to help Indonesian government to achieve the 30 watt, 35 gigawatt um, power initiative. So we were there um, presenting our, our services to uh, potential clients there, a private and public sector. So obviously the um, presentation was to the Indonesian um, electricity, uh, Ministry of Power actually, and mm. um, other private sectors. And so also US top uh, 500 fortune companies 
were all there. So we were very lucky to be included. <laughs> so you're, you are focused on the private sector rather than governments or nonprofits or NGOs or that kind of thing? Well, the long-term plan is to uh, bid on a federal government contract, but uh, in order to do so, the government looks at our past performance, and I thought that um, by venturing into the private sector would be the best way to get um, the company's past performance. Um, if you look through our website, um, the first thing I did with the company when I started building it was to... to recruit a uh, board of advisors because these are very senior people who have you know, um, a range of expertise in oil and gas and defense and manufacturing that would uh, that gives the company more credibility because it is a startup um, and at the same time it gives that that expertise in in helping the company to to, to problem solve in in the energy and the manufacturing sector that I'm focusing on, it's in it all specifically in the Asia region, Asia and in the U.S. Actually, mm. I see. I see. Yeah, interesting. Well, um, now uh, let's see if we can get your uh, PowerPoint up on the screen, and maybe we could go through that. Can we okay. get the PowerPoint up? One second. We're going to get that up, and then. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, here we go. We, we were a little premature on this before, but here we go. So um, why risk management? And uh, mm -hmm. maybe you could explain a little bit about this slide to us. Okay. Um, well, we, through my experience working at the same thing and particularly um, being a participant um, as the young leaders, um, with the CSIS Pacific Forum, I noticed that a lot of our discussions, you know, at the international level, um, security, foreign policy, um, a lot of conflict could be derived from just very basic everyday business decisions, you know. So I wonder if, you know, business people know what we know and understand the impl implications that the business decisions could have on, on, you know, at the global level of geopolitics and what they still make the same decision. So I took that and um, I saw a, a, a trend, which is, you know, government to government and business to government um, deals um, sometimes are very irresponsible and this irresponsibility often led to domestic unrest and, mm -hmm. and it reduces productivity at the local level just because it disrupts the supply chain and um, damage assets and reputation um, at the, of the company. And then companies go into this crisis mode and then they, they try to manage it after they see um, uh, these negative effects. But often it's too late because you're in a crisis management mode. So what we're trying to advocate is uh, to identify these potential um, problem areas, but and for actively manage them. We're not saying that just because um, the company should utilizes our services that there would be no risk in venturing into these markets, but by identifying them, at least we see it coming and have policies in place to actively trying to minimize them. I see. Mm -hmm. Should we move on to the next slide then? Okay, can we go into the next slide in that PowerPoint? This is the G2G and B2G agreements. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next slide is really just you know, more visual, um, an example on how G2G to B2G agreements could lead to crisis management. And I pointed to um, the, the example um, in, let's see, in Laos, um, and also in Cambodia, and also in Beijing, um, these are, yeah, the government decisions, business decisions that led to protests and, and, and sometimes turn very violent. Mm. I see. Yeah. I see. You know, I, I think you might want to mention to the audience what your company's website is, so um, they can write it down and uh, check it out. Would you? Would you just remind us of what it is? 
my company name? The right? website. The website. Oh, it's www.asiatactics.com. Okay. And it's spelled A-S-I-A-P-A-K-T-I-K.com. Okay, and we just flashed it on the screen, too. Good, so people got it, um, they got it um, two ways. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, um, now let me see. Your company is basically headquartered in Houston, but you do yes. have agents in Washington. Is that correct? Yes, I have uh, two senior advisors in Washington, D.C. I have one in Los Angeles, and I have two here in Houston with me. My very first senior advisor is um, Dr. Chris Young, um, who's now with the Marine Corps University in D.C., um, in Virginia, actually, and he was my former boss. So <laughs> he signed on um, pretty much with, to help supporting my effort, and he thought it was an interesting idea, um, and I have been updating him on my progress um, after my Honolulu experience. And, mm. He thought that there's definitely a niche here, what I'm trying to accomplish. And so he my first advisor. And then the other ones just by through, I think, networking and by luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to take a commercial here. Uh, you're watching Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, we've been talking to Jenny Lin. Uh, Jenny Lin is the CEO and founder of Asia Tactic, uh, LLC. And uh, she's coming to us from Houston, uh, Texas. Uh, this is a real interesting story about a company, a startup company, uh, which is also owned and managed by a minority woman. And we'll be right back in about one minute. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of Jenny, the Hawaii we have one minute. Clean Energy, okay. which is okay. our flagship show. So can you hear me all right, everything? Uh, I'm having and a little the, uh, trouble, but basically I can hear you. Um, and the Hawaii Energy. I, I don't want you to yell, but if you could speak a little right louder, it would be helpful. I just had a hearing test a couple weeks ago, show. and they tell uh, me my hearing is failing me. Oh, no. Okay. I'll remind myself to do that. I think I have really soft voice, so I have to... Yeah, consciously tell myself to Okay, we're going to come back now. A minute just went by really fast. Here we are. We're back at Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. We're talking to uh, Jenny Lin. Uh, she's uh, joining us uh, from uh, Houston, Texas, uh, via landline. She's an aspiring uh, entrepreneur, and she's been telling us about her company uh, and how it got started and uh, some of the things it seeks to do. So um, tell me this, what's your, what's your long-term program? Um, well, let's say short-term goals and long-term goals for the company. Um, short-term plan. Um, short-term plan, definitely a lot more business development activity in the private sector so we can earn more past performance that is required by the federal government when they look at our capability statement. They want to know what we've done. So that leads to our long-term plan, which is to bid for government contracts so that we can assist um, U.S. agencies in their international development projects. Um, yeah, that's pretty much. <laughs> well, uh, let me see. Now, when you started your company, which at this point uh, is a small business, I, I assume, um, mm -hmm. Did you go to the Small Business Administration? Were they helpful to you? Were any of those government services for startup companies helpful? Um, there are a lot of programs at the local level, but you know, when people talk about small business, um, some could be around for a long time, and these are million-dollar small businesses. And so it's difficult to really get the help that I need, at least from my own personal experience, I mm. couldn't get the help from the SBA. Um, and even with their, their initiative on, you know, one-on-one -on -one matchmaking um, programs, it's very difficult because, again, even in the private sector, uh, prime contractors want to look at your past performance as well. And they can to go with what, what they know. So they don't want to change suppliers or vendors, you know, because there's a risk on their part as well um, in using new uh, suppliers. So it's challenging. You have to navigate through um, layers and layers of, of uh, relationships, 
Hi, Faith. Hi. And My name is Jenny Lynn. It's difficult I'm... on me because it's all about funding, I think. Um, you almost need to have a large funding for business One way to do it more efficiently. Um, in building relationships with these prime contractors and also their subcontractors and just trying to get a small, a teeny piece of what they have so that you can build your, your, um, your resume almost for the company. Even right. though myself and all of our advisors have, you know, extensive experience and their respective fields, but that's not enough. They still look at uh, us as uh, as startup. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, how about do you do you have investors in the company, or are you doing this pretty much yourself? Or I'm doing this by myself. Um, I've I've looked at different funding avenues. I've gone to banks. I've talked to angel investors. Um, and in the end, I've decided to use my own, my own, yeah, resources. Right. So pretty much family, just family supporting me through this whole process. Um, oh, so that's ha great. I've learned that's to great. Be, yeah, I learned to be very resourceful. So um, it's the learning process. It's only in business. It's, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done, I think, in my life because within a week, I, I can wear so many different hats because I'm um, essentially every single department. Um, PR, I'm business development, marketing, I'm web designer, <laughs> I'm a researcher. Um, yeah. So well, you, you know, now uh, I, I want to get some of your strategic insight on China and other parts of Asia, but before we make that segue, I want to ask you this question, mm -hmm. uh, sort of for the benefit of everyone that's listening. if somebody in our audience out there wanted to start a small business what's the best piece of advice you could give them have a robust funding <laughs> um and and definitely start at a business incubator if they can okay. um, but do yeah there i know you said one but there's just so much there's so much elements to it to, to make a successful business would so they I need a good really business plan as well Yes. Um, a business plan is a great start, but I think it changes, at least with me. Mm. My head, I started with a business plan, um, and I developed it with a business um, a consultant. But since then, the company definitely has evolved because as I learn, I incorporate my new knowledge into the plan in my head and then change the direction of the company. So we we didn't start out as a risk management service company. We started out as just a company that wanted to assist U.S. companies uh, um, sell their products and services in Asia. But then people started to treat us as a, a trading company, and that's not what we are. Um, that was actually the story I wanted to talk, tell you about. That was the origin of the, the, the um, company as well is that I saw how small and mid-sized businesses um, get connected to overseas ventures and partners. Um, that is, they don't always do it with the safest, mm. in the safest way. They do business with people that they know, uh, um, who who introduce them to someone that they know in in an Asian country, for example. So they'll go through you know chamber of commerce people. And then they organize these, you know, delegations and meetings. And then it's, it's mm. businesses almost are left there, you know, having to develop that relationship themselves. Yes, they, they were able to go to a, a, a general platform to get these, you know, opportunities. But um, do they have the resources to conduct, conduct background checks on these potential partners? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, do they have the resources to... Um, and research uh, the corruption level and do they do their homework in comparing, you know, the cities and they're trying to venture into. Like, for example, maybe they could compare, you know, Yunnan, China to um, somewhere in Vietnam and to somewhere in the Philippines, you know. Do they do that? Um, I don't see it. I see people, again, going, you know, relying on personal relationships. Um, and often they get in trouble that way, but some don't. So it's, it's oh, interesting. 
Well, now we want to we want to make a segue here. We we have about 15 minutes left here, um, okay. and we we want to hear your view on the rebalance because we know you spent a lot of time um, in working in those different research institutes that you did, um, mm -hmm. especially I think Project 2049. Um, mm -hmm. On the rebalance, what, what's your take on the rebalance? Where are we on the rebalance? <laughs> Um, I don't know, actually. I don't know where we are on the U.S. side. Um, I've been focused on developing the business, but as I traveled, um, especially in the um, Southeast Asian region, I noticed that China is doing very well in their strategy, encountering our fruit island, if it exists. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> if it exists. Yeah. Right. That's, a, that's um, an interesting answer, yeah. Yeah. Because um, Xi Jinping has um, his Isai Lu strategy. So it's pretty much the Silk Road um, and the Maritime Silk Road that mm -hmm. they're trying to establish. And um, the, I hear stories of, of you know, China, China just going into a particular Asian country with you know, their own funding, their own uh, personnel equipment, and they built what they want. And that's how they can get their foot in the door faster than everyone else. Um, while sometimes we have U.S. companies going in that aren't GE, that aren't you know the largest corporations around, they are waiting around for for funding or for you know partnerships to evolve so that again they have um, the money to go in and and build what they can. Um, it's it's not the most efficient, I think, if we want to beat China at the speed of which they can invest in in these countries, but we still have the quality. So mm. I don't know <laughs> how we're doing, actually, but they are definitely beating it up. <laughs> well, well, let me maybe maybe turn this question around a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Put it, and, well, I guess actually it would be a different question. Where do you see China in 10 years, um, economically, militarily, strategically? Where do you see it in 10 years? Where do you see it in 20? Ten years and twenty years. Wow! If everything goes well, I think today they or their currency has been added to the basket, SDR basket, or been recognized by the IMF. If that trend continues, and if China is committed in reforming its financial institutions and allowing the free flow of currency, then in ten or twenty years they will do very well. Because right now, what they're doing with their um, their Silk Road plan is to um, get rid of their access capacity in the construction and the transportation sector. So their companies are able to continue to build in these emerging markets. Mm. Um, they could export more products and services into these countries. Um, and in, in turn, the money earned goes back into the government and they will have more budget for to build their defense needs. So there, I don't know, <laughs> it's pretty scary seeing the speed at which um, the PRC is able to um, continue to grow, you know, economically and, and, and um, defense-wise. And in comparison, I don't know how well the U.S. is doing right now because my focus has been on Asia and what, what they're doing. Mm. Uh, and I don't think we can't afford to, we can't afford to outspend the Chinese in any of these countries. Um, and But we can't keep playing the, the, the catch-up game either. But while I was doing a, a bit of research um, before this, this uh, interview, I came across a, um, a GAO report, actually. It's a recent report, and um, it has a timeline on U.S.-China uh, trade initiatives. Um, 
based on that GAO report, the Chinese is actually reacting to our um, trade initiatives in Asia. So I'm trying to, I didn't send you a, a copy of, of that timeline, but um, yeah. Mm. But it's, it's the Chinese reacting to our, our initiative there, but they want to do it bigger and better. Okay. Um, and so, let, let yeah. me ask you this question, a curveball question. <laughs> Take a swing at it. Um, is democracy right for China? Is democracy right for China? Is it right? Is it right for China? Is it right? Yeah. Okay. It's so many people say, well, China should be a democratic country. Um, like a Western democratic country. And some people refute that notion um, for various reasons. Well, what, what's your take? What's your idea on that? Um, it's, it's tough because I'm looking at the democratic countries right now and their economy seems to be stagnant. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's because of democracy that their economies are stagnant, but it is not the most efficient in, in decision making. So I think if China prioritizes the economy first and making their their um, people wealthy, maybe democracy is not the right type of um, form of government right now. But right, in the future, right, right. they will have to go towards that because the people will naturally demand it. Um, and I don't know. We'll oh, no, I agree with you. I think you're, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those people that, to me, those people that advocate China must be democratic now. Uh, when I look at the Arab Spring and some other experiments of that sort, it's not very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. I think people tend to abuse it. You know, if they don't know what it means to be democratic, they don't know what it means to respect basic human rights. Um, then it would be very chaotic because mm. anyone could could do anything almost in the name of of democracy, of, of free speech, of you know, and um, it it could be damaging. I think if they don't know how, I don't know what it is. I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this question. Now, I I recall you mentioning to me that you're originally from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, so what's your views on Taiwan these days? Um, it's very interesting to watch right now because the Xi, Xi Jinping and Lai ying meeting, meeting, um, so many people criticize it. If you watch the Chinese website, mm -hmm. um, they criticize Ma's performance um, in Singapore, even though I think the official survey said that about 80% supports the meeting. But the aftermath of it, you know, still, uh, I think based on a, uh, a Taiwan Brain Trust survey, mm -hmm. um, this is consisting of over 1,100 people over age of 20 in Taiwan. Um, uh, let's see, over about 70% of interviewees are worried that Taiwan will become part of China in the future. Um, um, about 98% of interviewees consider themselves Taiwanese and 2% Chinese. So there's a, I think, a general worry um, in Taiwan in the non-elite circle that Taiwan will be part of China. Now, when I was in Taiwan for two months, um, I've, I've... You were in Taiwan recently for two months? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was in Taiwan between um, August and, and September. Mm. And um, my impression is that it, within the elite circle of Taiwanese businessmen, um, they think that it's only a natural pro course that Taiwan will be back, you know, be reunified with China um, within 10 years. And they see that as a, a natural progression just because now, of now let that. Me, let me make sure I understand that because I think that's an important point you're making. These these businessmen in, that you were talking to in Taiwan, they believe Taiwan will be part of China within 10 years? Did I get that right? Yes. Oh, that's very interesting. In the elite circle. And then there are rumors while I was in Taiwan 
that um, that the elite circle, especially the Kuomintang, the KMT, have already been bought by the mainland China. So these are just rumors that people would, you know, privately discuss. Um, so I don't know how truthful they are, but um, I see a difference, though, in opinion of of you know whether or not Taiwan should be independent or should you know be back with mainland China. The differences in opinion. Is associated with, you know, whether or not they're in the elite circle. Mm. I think whether or not they have a lot of uh, assets already on the mainland, or they have uh, beginning to sell their assets, you know, to mainland Chinese. So that's the question I came back with: is you know, how many Taiwanese or KMT elite-owned assets are in TRC, and how much of their assets have been sold? And then also, have the majority of the, the Taiwanese KMT been bought? By PRC, I think will be an interesting study, but I don't know how. how yeah. It'll yeah. I, I have to admit, I myself had a little problem with seeing Taiwan as part of the mainland. Um, to, to me, it just seems these two societies have evolved so differently. Um, mm -hmm. People, when I, uh, I, I probably have mentioned on the show before, but when I go to China and I talk to China's Taiwan experts. I actually, I think most of them are pretty reasonable, and um, they, they say that it's a long-term process, 20 years. Okay. These businessmen, they seem to want to speed it up. <laughs> <laughs> they said about 10 years, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, right. But I, I don't know. I, I take it as a grain of salt, though, um, because I didn't look into, again, exactly how vested they are, you know, how mm -hmm. much have they invested in, in, in on the mainland. So I don't know. So it'll be interesting to, to watch, I think. Right, right. Very interesting. A very interesting election coming up. Uh, well, we just have a couple minutes left here, just two minutes left, actually. Um, I know that you're a person that pays most, most, because most of your attention to China and Taiwan. But there are other players in Asia. Prime Minister Abe, what's your take on him? And I have to ask you to make this kind of a quick response. Oh, um, I actually haven't followed what Mr. Abe has been doing, actually, or anything about Japan. Sorry. <laughs> I can't okay. comment on that because I've been focused on selling the company. And, right. And whatever right, information right. I happen to come across while I, I've done that, I've shared. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're coming down here to this, uh, as I said, our last couple of minutes. Uh, is there something else you want to bring up, share with the audience, um, a concern that you have that you might want to, you know, put out to the audience? Um, no, I think I'm good for now. Actually, I don't have um, any black points. <laughs> Thank you, though, for the opportunity. Uh, oh, you, well, you're time. quite welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Lynn. I'm yeah, um, we're down to one minute now, so we, we're just going to ask you this real, real quick. Um, what do you think China's greatest strength is? What do you think its greatest weakness is? My greatest strength and my greatest weakness? No, China's. <laughs> oh, We know you China? have a lot of strengths, yeah. <laughs> but how about China? What's China's number one strength, its number one weakness? I think it's itself. Um, everything that it's great at right now, the speed in which it's able to do things and, and, and just seemingly to, to buy their way through everything mm. um, could be their own weakness as well. Um, mm. If they don't manage it, you know, well, um, we saw what happened with the free falling their stocks back in, mm. I think, September. Um, if they didn't learn a lesson from that, then they will be in trouble, I think. Jenny, I yeah. think I'm going to have to cut you off here. That, that okay. evil clock says it's time to end the show. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for joining us today uh, okay. and sharing, you know, information about your company with us. I think you probably have given a lot of inspiration to other folks that want to start a small business and uh, sharing your views with us um, on China. So thank Thanks. you very much for joining us. And thank you uh, for tuning in today. And we'll see you right here next week, uh, same time, same station. Aloha. Hi, 
My name is Jenny Lin. I'm founder and CEO of this is that I realize uh. I'm passionate about problem solving. And one way to do it more efficiently oh, we is can by get assembling a team of experts. The problem is, as economies become more globalized, the more challenging it is for governments and companies to maintain their reputation and protect their investments. Entities find themselves navigating in hybrid and floor-like environments, which increase the risk of doing business. So a major challenge for many decision makers is, how can I make the best project more effectively and more efficiently under those conditions? It is Asia Tactics' job to help our clients identify and manage non-technical risks, such as political risk and security risk, which involves operational and cyber. It is Asia Tactics' purpose to help our clients minimize those risks and at the same time be a force for good. What differentiates Asia Tactics from our competitor is, one, we take an organic approach to problem solving, and two, we don't provide cookie-cutter solutions, and three, we keep our operations small so that we can keep costs down for our clients. For more information about Asia Tactics, please visit us at www.asiatactics.com or please write us at info at asiatactics.com. I look forward to learning more about your business and your challenges and see how Asia Tactics and our team of advisors could help you.